and a very warm welcome to day two of the 13th Livelihoods India Summit. We are beginning the day with a plenary session on reimagining SHGs, transforming to strategic business enterprises. This session has been co-curated with Madhya Pradesh Day State Rural Livelihoods Mission as we celebrate 10 years of their exemplary work. I warmly welcome the moderator, Narendranath Damodran, Integrator Pradhan, to take his place on stage. I would now like to invite on stage our distinguished panelists for the session. Elam Belwal, CEO, Madhya Pradesh State Rural Livelihoods Mission. <laughs> R.V. Ramakrishna, General Manager, NABAD. Charanjit Singh, Additional Secretary, Ministry of Rural Development, Government of India. S. Divya Darshni, MD CEO, Tamil Nadu State Rural Livelihoods Mission and CEO, Tamil Nadu Rural Transformation Project. Girija Srinivasan, Expert, Development Finance and Rural Livelihoods. I now hand over to Narendranath Damodran to take this session forward. Good morning, everybody. So it's an illustrious panel here. I don't think anybody of them require any special uh, introduction. They're all well accomplished in their own uh, responsibilities, what they're doing, and have had have spent you know years and years in working on uh, self-help groups and uh, their evolution into livelihoods organizations. Uh, the SAG movement, as you know, which is now, I think, all over uh, India, and it's now also spread to many parts of the world. Uh, SAG movement, which found its roots in the civil society organizations in the mid 80s, late 80s, uh, then further got taken up by the NAVAD and Reserve Bank of India, Now it, and later on by the government of India through its flagship programs. And now it has found root across the country. In every nook and corner of the country, we have uh, self-help groups. And as I understand recently, I mean, uh, looking at the recent data, about a, about 10 million self-help groups exist in the country today, give or take. I mean, this that is the order of the number of groups. Uh, and um, more than 10 crore rural poor women have been have been organized as part of this movement. That is massive. I mean, that that kind of a size and scale doesn't exist anywhere in the world, and it suits the uh, scale and size of uh, the <clears throat> problem of poverty in India also. It's a very large-scale initiative, and in the initial years, as the SSG movement found its feet uh, through the Rural Livelihoods Mission, and in the last 10 years, I believe more than 6 lakh to 8 lakh crore rupees have moved through the system in uh, in terms of loans and you know uh, revolving funds etc and that has had its own uh, spillover effects into livelihoods so today as part of the livelihoods mission and as one of the opening sessions of uh, the final day here we are looking at how the self help groups have been able to effectively address the issue of livelihoods so sgs had two primary roles one is to address the solving the problem of rural financing, rural credit. Now that is a question we need to study and we need to look at again, given the quantum, given the the, uh, the amount of uh, resources that has moved into the system, how much to what extent has it solved the rural credit problem? That is one side. But here we're going to look at analyze uh, how has the um, rural livelihoods mission through the SAG you know, institutions being able to address the livelihoods problem of the uh, rural poor households and what have been the various strategies and pathways adopted. So this session per se looks at uh, self-help groups as strategic business enterprises, SAGs themselves as business enterprises, group enterprises, etc. But I think uh, given the experience, the panel here will also talk about how the SAGs have been instrumental in looking at, uh, you know, building up enterprises at the in the countryside. Uh, so, without much ado, uh, I will hand over the mic to the panel. Uh, we will go, uh, you know, we would have uh, um, Madam uh, Divedarshini to start this session. Then I think uh, Dr. Belwal could follow. Then we will have an overview of the NRLM itself from uh, Mr. Singh. And then we'll, I will ask uh, Ramakrishna and Girija to take over after that, to give the larger conceptual picture. Is that okay with the panel? Yeah. So we have, as we said, limited time. So we'll all uh, stick to our allotted seven to eight minutes of uh, presentation time. Thank you. And later on, we'll have a question session. So note down all the questions. We'll have a question answer session right after the panelists are presented. Thank you. A uh, very good morning to all the uh, fellow panelists, uh, to additional secretary, sir, here. 
and also to other uh, members uh, who's participating in this uh, plenary session today morning and also to the moderator so uh, the topic for today is uh, reimagining sgs and how do we want to think them as uh, business entrepreneurs so this is actually very very uh, i mean interesting uh, topic for all of us to think now because uh, 10 years 15 years back when we thought of sgs it was about bringing them from the uh, clutches of money lenders giving them uh, uh, rural credit and taking them out of the uh, rural indebtedness that they were suffering from giving them access to finance was a bigger thing that 15 years uh, one and a half decades back we thought was very difficult to achieve especially through the banking system through the form sectors obviously there were NGOs who were doing this before they were uh, um, governments uh, looking at different programs through uh, other uh, uh, world forums like the IFAD the uh, UN programs and the World Bank assisted programs which are doing this but now uh, if you just take a step back and think that in 2012 before the NRLM or before the uh, entire access to financial linkages in the inclusion part uh, would we have thought that this size of uh, lending to women who had no uh, uh, security as such, uh, nothing, if you think that it is uh, unthinkable, I mean, for a state like Tamil Nadu, which is doing like 25,000 crores this year, we have we are looking at a target of uh, reaching uh, rural credit to uh, through SAGs at a scope of roughly about uh, 25,000 crores. Last year, we have done 21,000 crores. So this is a number that we would not have thought about some 10 years or 15 years back. But then this paradigm shift that bankers and the banking sector has gone through in the last 10 years is unimaginable. And now we are going to the next cycle. That is, how do we see these SAG women as entrepreneurs? That's another paradigm shift that the banking sector needs to go through now. We see SAG women as poor rural women who come together for doing micro savings to meet their uh, uh, demands of uh, uh, household, for uh, meeting their um, household demands of, uh, what do you say, your uh, uh, livelihood, your uh, education, health, distress, all these things. But now, bankers have been accustomed to it. Today, uh, a single SAG member leading the SAG group can walk into a bank with no apprehensions of facing a bank manager, a cashier, and asking for a loan of 10 lakhs. This was unthinkable a decade back. And that's what the uh, Livelihoods Mission has brought to the, uh, 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 the rural side of the country. And um, now, uh, coming back to the topic of reimagining these SAGs, that's when I think that uh, uh, we all, especially the banking sector, the government has started thinking in that uh, uh, dimension. That is, SAGs as such, we see them as entities of rural poverty. They're trying to come out of it. But now over the decade, they have passed that stage and now they are growing into entities of enterprises. They are individual enterprises, there are group enterprises coming out of it. For example, if I had to take Tamil Nadu as an example, uh, through the NRLM program, before that, uh, with the IFAD program and other programs, we have had uh, brought the uh, rural livelihoods out of poverty. We had given them access to credit, we have uh, uh, brought financial inclusion through formal sectors of financing, and all of this has been done. So now we have started thinking in the last five years, six years, we have started thinking about how do we make them entrepreneurs? Because uh, uh, making them uh, go to a bank, take loan for uh, meeting their uh, needs and then pay back them, it's not going to be a sustainable one both for the country and for the household of uh, these poor women. So we have started thinking of this program uh, called as a Tamil Nadu Rural Transformation Program, not going into the details further, but this program is looking at how do we uh, strengthen the uh, SAG uh, livelihoods uh, as an entrepreneurial model. So uh, we are, uh, uh, for this again, the banking sector also needs to be brought into the loop. When you see the MSME sector, you see an MSME sector, you uh, see that there's always gender biases everywhere. When you see, tell the word entrepreneur, the first image that comes to all of your mind is a male, is a youngster, is somebody who has studied. If an SAG has to break all these three barriers and then be recognized as an entrepreneur for a bank to finance her business model from a rural sector, is what uh, what needs to be done. 
So to bring confidence into the banking uh, system, to bring uh, uh, um, confidence into the financial, formal financial institutions, to lend to these, institu uh, to lend to these uh, rural uh, entrepreneurs is really uh, interesting. So we have this program where we actually give a subsidy. I know this is a word of uh, contempt nowadays, but it's actually a, a means of encouragement uh, to these entrepreneurs for banks to lend. It's basically for the, building the confidence in the uh, formal financial institutions to uh, lend to these rural women, new entrepreneurs, to s get access to formal financial channels of uh, loans to start their business. So we have started this program and we have seen so many enterprises already exist, but exist for maybe five years, six years, 10 years. There are enterprises run by SHG women, smaller sizes, which have never had access to finance for the last decade. It was very surprising for us to learn in the last one, two years since we started this program called as a matching grant program where we have 60% uh, to 70% the bank lends to the uh, uh, enterprises for their business uh, concern. And then 10% is brought in by an uh, uh, input from the person as in uh, uh, seed money. And then 30% is given as a back-end subsidy to the individual, but it's given as a front-end subsidy to the bank to, so that you get the reliance of the bank uh, in lending to these rural SAG new entrepreneurs. So this has caught the attention of the bankers. It is building the uh, uh, confidence of the women here and uh, what it's changing into rural, uh, uh, um, uh, the ecosystem that needs to be developed is uh, really, really great that we're seeing in Tamil Nadu. And uh, as an entrepreneur, an SAG as an entrepreneur, uh, I think that needs to be broken. You see women as an entrepreneur. SAGs have been formed to uh, uplift the confidence of women, both individually and financially. That has been accomplished. I think the Rural Livelihoods Mission, a lot of other programs of the government of India and the states have done that and shown it as an example. Now we have to break that barriers. Uh, banks have to come out of it and think that lending to SAGs or women is not merely financial inclusion. It's much more than that. It's much more than that. It is going to add to the GDP. Imagine uh, there are at least uh, eight, uh, sorry, 34 percent of the uh, enterprises today run in Tamil Nadu, the uh, micro and uh, medium small enterprises are run by women. That's one of the highest numbers in the country. So if banks start uh, uh, lending to them, keeping uh, 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 reliance on the self-confidence of running the enterprises, obviously there's one gap that needs to be addressed by the government, needs to be addressed and thought about by all of us. How do we strengthen the capacities of these new enterprises? These are very, very nascent enterprises. They are growing. And every business enterprises learns a lot from their success, but learns much more from their losses and their failures. So how do we inculcate the business practices of, an, uh, uh, of running a new enterprise? How do you uh, teach them the management, operations, and how do you teach them marketing? The, the greatest and the weakest link also of any business is going to be the marketing, and especially for rural India. So uh, I think the one thing, if, if, if it's going to be that every one of us here is going to be taking back from uh, at the end of this session would be like, it's not SAGs as enterprises. It's rural women as enterprises. It's making rural women as entrepreneurs. And all of us need to see that change. And that's what is one thing that I have learned in the last six months that I've been uh, given this opportunity to uh, work in this livelihoods mission has been. And I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot more from my uh, colleagues in the service. I've learned a lot from these new entrepreneurs in the rural side. And that's, that's my only big takeaway of uh, the entire thing. I'll have my last word. Obviously, I'll give opportunity for the others to, uh, to talk also. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Divya Dashini. I think you summarized it well, that the self-help group, the mission itself, and the government, the banks, they all create an ecosystem in which the women entrepreneurs are able to really go out and flourish. Um, it's a wonderful uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, now I'll move on to Dr. Belva. Yes, sure, sure, please. Do you have a presentation or something? No, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Vipin Sharma, for giving me this opportunity today to be here with you, with you all. My name is LM Belwal. I am CEO of MPSRLM. And I am one of those fortunate 
guys who have been associated with the NRLM right from the beginning. And believe me that NRLM is a game changer. A complete socio-economic and political also to some extent revolution is going on. At least I can say what is happening in the state of Madhya Pradesh. I have not read many books and definitely I have not written any book. Whatever, whatever experience I have gained, I have gained in the villages of Madhya Pradesh. Earlier I used to be a forest officer. That time I always considered the villagers as enemies of forest because they were dependent for their daily needs on the forest. But when I changed my card, I came to this end of the fence, then I realized that they are the best friends and they need a lot of support from people like us and people like you. So when the NRLM started, in fact, we all were, we were meeting some of them, us were meeting that uh, those days also. We're not very sure whether the NRLM will be a success or it will be like any other program of government. But in the state of Madhya Pradesh, we have been able to organize about 4.6 million women into SSGs. And you will be very happy to know that out of these 4.6 million women, 3.2 million women are into livelihoods activities now. And that is, I think, above this national average. The, the SSG women, in fact, the key to their success is continuous training and capacity building. Train, be that uh, training on institution building or training on livelihoods. There have been large number of income generating activities, farm and non-farm in the state of Madhya Pradesh. There are entrepreneurs emerging individuals and there have been many group enterprises. To name some of them, uh, let me share with you that we, we have a very large marble cluster coming up near Jabalpur in the state of Madhya Pradesh where uh, uh, within a period of six months or so, 1,000 women will be associated. Similarly, we have a jacket, Modi jacket, we call it, Nehru jacket, sometimes we call it. A jacket cluster has emerged in the district of Shivpuri where 2,500 women are associated with that now. And people are coming to uh, buy those uh, jackets from, uh, not only from Madhya Pradesh, but from uh, states like UP, Bihar and Rajasthan also. Then, uh, we have many other such clusters and uh, we have uh, promoted 88 producer companies in the state of Madhya Pradesh. Out of them, 77 producer companies, the shareholders in these companies are only women. And uh, uh, I am very happy to share with you that uh, the, the annual turnover of these 88 uh, uh, producer companies was 519 crore last year and this year it has already reached 520 crores which means that it will reach a figure of 560 or so. This is what we are hoping. What does it, it mean? It means that women are really after uh, organizing, uh, after they have been organized into SSGs, they are working, they are, they are uh, into income generating activities. One there are two big indicators to this, to my mind. Number one, the bank loan, the bank credit uh, to the SSGs in the state of Madhya Pradesh uh, in the year 2021 was 475 crore. Then 21, 23, it was 1,470 crore. And this year is, it has already reached 2,000 crore. This is a very big indicator that whatever money and the NPA is less than 2% which means that the, uh, the women are using the money and if they are using the money, they are generating money also so they are repaying the money to the banks. Second uh, a big indicator is that now government of India says that we have to make each and every uh, SSG woman a Lakhpati and by Lakhpati they mean a, a woman who earns minimum 1 lakh rupees per annum on a sustainable basis. In fact, when, when the NRLM 
started in 1213, I used to say that this is a scheme which is going to make each and every BPL in our country a Lakhpati. And uh, for us in the state of Madhya Pradesh, we say that a woman who earns minimum 10,000 rupees per month on a sustainable basis is a Lakhpati. So what I'm saying here is that the second biggest indicator is that we have more than 1 million such Lakhpatis in the state of Madhya Pradesh out of 4.6 and we have counted them also. We keep their record also. The exact number would be 1.35 million. So uh, what does it mean? It means that we are very hopeful that in coming, uh, in fact, we, one day we are uh, carrying out an exercise that maybe in the next coming seven years, each and every SSG member would be a Lakhpati. So NRLM has the potential of changing the game. NRLM has the potential of removing the rural poverty from the country. And I was citing the examples of Madhya Pradesh only, but it is happening so in other parts of this uh, country also. To cite few individual examples, that one uh, lady in the district of Mandla, her name is Anisha Bai. She joined the group in 13-14 and uh, at that point of time, she was earning hardly 3,500 rupees per a month. And uh, you will be surprised to know that now she has an income of 50,000, 50 to 55,000 per month. And that is that too is on sustainable basis because what she has done is uh, she has set up a garage, her uh, husband is working there, and she is employing five people also. So the the employment seeker has become employment giver. This is one example. Another example is that one uh, lady called Badwani, sorry Vaishali in the district Badwani, and uh, the block is uh, uh, Thikri. She has opened. A, uh, stitching center where more than 50 women are working. So this is a, an example of group enterprise. There are more than 300 such group inter enterprises uh, only on stitching in the state of Madhya Pradesh where minimum 20 women are working throughout the year. And they, they are supplying apparels to people within the state and outside the state. So since the, uh, I think I have already, uh, I am about to cross the time and uh, but uh, what I'm saying is that NRL, yes, and I would invite uh, whoever wants to come to Madhya Pradesh, please come and see our work. And uh, if we have really done good work, kindly appreciate. Otherwise, guide us. Thank you very much. Delwal sir, to first sticking to the time, that is so kind of you. Uh, and it's an open offer to anyone to go to Madhya Pradesh and see that wonderful work. See, I think one important focus he mentioned on from the livelihood perspective to have a very strong outcome focus. So actually measuring the income, net additional income that the mission has been able to create and then measuring it and counting that. I think it's a that outcome focus is very important and the cluster approach I thought is really, really appreciative that, you know, we can build an ecosystem of services around that uh, enterprise that actually helps more and more poor people to get into that and then focus on marketing, institutional market, I think it's a very important point. Thank you so much, Velval sir. It's very educated. Uh, I will uh, hand it over to Mr. Uh, Singh for an overview of the NRLM itself and the lessons thereof. Thank you. Also, please. please, please. So, thanks to Belwal Saab and Devedarshini also because they have set the stage uh, so solid by their work. Uh, so, I will just uh, give you a brief overview of how we are working. And uh, so, I, we have got an esteemed audience. So, I don't know how to give you the overall picture the NRLM is doing. So I have got two incidents which I think will put the things into perspective. And uh, as Belwal sub said, I was uh, in uh, Madhya Pradesh only a few days back and I was in Dindori district. If you know about uh, the geography of India, it's a very interior district of Madhya Pradesh uh, and I met the SSG woman there. And one of the SSG women was Sarpanch. And then she told me that uh, due to the empowerment she got from this SSG movement, she was unanimously elected Sarpanch of the village. Sarpanch, in, you know, for the convenience of our foreign friends, is a, a village head. So like that, 710 women were elected in Dindori district only. So this shows the empowerment and silent revolution taking place in India. We are just facilitating it. 
the movement has launched and i will give you one more instance to put the things more into perspective and two months back i was in gujarat and i met one lady also there of SSG. She was elected the Jila Panchayat Adhyaksh. Jila Panchayat Adhyaksh is the head of the district. And then I congratulated her. I said, you've done a lot of work. You've become Jila Panchayat ki Adhyaksh. Ban gi. Sir, now I am... She replied to me, ki now I want to contest the MLA election also. Wow. I said, why not? I said, 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 I 8.75 crore households covered by the NRLM movement and we have mobilized around 81 lakh SNGs. So this is a broad picture which shows you the contours. So, so I will just give you some food for thought rather than going into the details of the scheme that will bore you and I don't want to bore you. So the issue is about the enterprise. And as uh, the earlier speakers also mentioned, we have done a lot of uh, bank linkage, etc. We have mobilized more than uh, 6 lakh crores. This figure, figure of 6 lakh crore was crossed few days back only. So this is the humongous amount. And last year we covered 1.2 lakh bank linkage. So this shows the amount of the liquidity into the rural sector. And what do the people do with this? Finances, they start some livelihood activity or some consumption purpose, no doubt about that. But we are facilitating uh, the entrepreneurship also. And I will just give you one example that how these enterprises are being developed. As you all know that I don't need to repeat it. You need the skills, you need the access to finance, knowledge, etc. Only then the enterprise can be established. And no doubt about the handholding also. Hand holding from the professionals, only then I think uh, the success can be achieved. So, there is one Balani milk producer company in Jhansi district of Uttar Pradesh. And this is the wholly owned by the women, as Belwal sir also said. There are more than 50,000 women members in that milk producer company. We started that in the year 2019. And our Honorable Prime Minister also interacted with this uh, milk producer company. They were so confident. Now, even if we speak to the Prime Minister, we feel slightly hesitated. They are not bothered at all. Openly then she spoke and she explained everything. And you will be surprised to know that within the short duration of uh, three to four years, they have a turnover of more than 400 crores. And out of that, 359 crores has gone to the members only. So you can see what impact that company is creating. And why I am mentioning that? Why do we need such companies? Because business is one thing. They address the whole value chain from backward linkages to the forward linkages. What are the backward linkages? What are the inputs required there? So, they are doing that. Some ethno-veterinary practices are there doing that. Fodder development they are doing. Artificial insemination they are doing. Then mineral mixture is being taken care of. So whole backward linkage is being taken care of. So not only they are buying more animals, the productivity of animals is also increasing. Then they are moving into the forward linkages also. Now they have started their ghee. They have started their selling it. A few days back, they have started milk mobile ATM. They have started milk mobile ATM. Se they can buy the milk from there. So, this is just one example I wanted to mention. That what is the power of if we work in a collective that is there. And second thing I want to highlight is that uh, there are so many schemes of the government. We feel that if we work uh, as a whole of the government approach, as our Honorable Prime Minister says, why whole of the government approach? There should be whole of the society approach. Why shouldn't all of us join hands, whether in the civil society sector, whether the private sector? I think we can make a huge change in the country and after few years, I, we 
feel that we will be standing in the front line of the committee of the nations if we work in that mode. That why I'm saying there is one scheme of PMFME, Pradhan Mantri Formalization of Micro Enterprises of the Ministry of Food Processing Industry. So what we are doing, that whole scheme is being implemented by the SSG women. That 800 crore is going to the SSG women only. So the seed capital for the food processing industry is being taken care of by that ministry only and they are giving it to us. So this I feel convergence is very important and we all need to work together. Third thing I feel is that we need to provide the best of the knowledge available in the country to the SHG women. And we have made an attempt, we are working with the two institutes that is the IIM Kolkata and IIM Bangalore. And the people in the country know that these are the two top notch institutes in the country regarding the management and they are providing the help to the our SSG women that how the enterprises need to be upskilled. So I feel that this dissemination of knowledge from the top level is also very important. And the next thing I wanted to highlight is there is a very strong startup culture in the uh, our country that also need to be leveraged and we are already we have established one rise hub in our ministry in association with the TRIF. So, where we are now associating these startups. So, I think we need to leverage the power of the young people and they can also make a huge difference in this direction. And the last thing I wanted to say is that uh, we need to provide technological innovations also to our researches. Because if we make a low cost solar dryer or cold storage, available at the village level. I feel that can make a lot of difference. And in this direction, we have already started working with the principal scientific advisor to Honorable Prime Minister. So they are going to help us that what type of technologies can be made available to our rural people. So these are some of the ideas which I wanted to throw to you so that you can think about that and see how we can work together. Thank you very much. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Singh. Again, very educative. Some very important points you raised there. One is on, I think the most important one from, from my perspective is the political empowerment of women, which I think, uh, you know, it's a silent revolution that is happening in this country. When you organized, you know, crows and crows of women into groups who kind of interact, meet, and organize themselves so, so, so systematically. I think there's a silent leadership uh, revolution of women that is emerging in this country. And I think that uh, has been getting not noticed and let's hope the future uh, leaders of the country emerge from these women's groups. Thank you so much. But you know, the political empowerment has a very strong economic pathway and that is what the mission is addressing. So you thought about bringing professional inputs, value chain, uh, um, you know, value chain perspective and ma unlocking market investments. And most importantly, the multi-stakeholder collaboration and you know, convergence that is so important. Thank you. Uh, from now, uh, I will move to Ram uh, to give a perspective of NABARD as the original national agency that you know patronized the SAG movement. Yeah, go ahead. Because uh, they have set a precedent, so I, sh I should be here. <laughs> uh, good morning, uh, uh, respected uh, fellow panelists and distinguished uh, audience. My name is uh, Ramakrishna. I am the officer in charge of the NABARD in Delhi. Uh, I have, uh, to introduce myself, I have worked in this SSG movement uh, since the beginning, I would say, yeah, uh, since the start of uh, the pilots uh, which NABARD did in the late 80s. Uh, and as you all know, NABARD has been the pioneer of the SSG bank linkage program. It is a totally homegrown uh, program uh, uh, which uh, was pioneered by NABARD uh, in association with uh, you know, uh, thousands of uh, rural bank branches and uh, thousands of NGOs, uh, without which I think this program would not be what it is today. Uh, uh, and as I've been working in this uh, sector and in the movement for so many years, uh, I have worked at various levels. So initially it was all operational and now it is all uh, strategic. So I have not gone into the field uh, <laughs> For so many years, I depend on the, on uh, 
uh, the knowledge of my fellow panelists for that. But then I think uh, we uh, we do get uh, feedback from the field uh, from uh, our uh, numerous DDMs who work in the field. Uh, NABAD has uh, a presence in all the districts. So we do get feedback uh, from the field. And uh, uh, I think just to put the things in perspective and to see the larger picture of, uh, of the theme, uh, see, we are the youngest population in the world. Yeah, average uh, the median age is about 28 years. Uh, more than 56 percent of the people are between 20 and 60. 47 percent of the workforce, sorry, 4.7 percent of the workforce is only skilled in India, compared to perhaps 50, 56 percent in uh, the U.S., 80 percent in Japan, and 96 percent in Korea. So there are lots of uh, gaps in the skills which. Uh, uh, I think uh, my fellow uh, predecessors have pre uh, preceding uh, speakers have spoken. Uh, and also this has been brought very clearly by the National uh, Skill Mission, uh, which uh, came out with this number of 40 crore uh, people to be skilled uh, in various sectors uh, by 2022. Why I'm bringing these things is because uh, SAG movement uh, is not uh, working in isolation. I think it works in... Uh, uh, in in the ecosystem around which uh, each of these people uh, function. Uh, in addition to this, I think we have the uh, PM's uh, Kaushal Vikas Yojana because uh, uh, my last posting was in Andaman. I used to see a lot of SAG women getting trained in this under this uh, program through the NGOs there. Uh, then again, uh, you know, there are uh, lots of skill programs of the skill ministry itself. Uh, and then uh, we have... Uh, uh, the 1.2 uh, crore uh, SAGs, roughly meaning about 15 crore uh, women, uh, who are uh, potential uh, uh, entrepreneurs and who could be setting up uh, uh, micro enterprises. Uh, then we have another 1.87 crore JLGs, again comprising about 9 crore farmers. And uh, in all the programs which NABAD has been supporting, uh, while we support social mobilization and we support, uh, uh, you know, uh, training and capacity building for managing uh, the groups and the social structures, we also have uh, components of building in uh, skills and uh, uh, training uh, required for managing each one's uh, livelihood. Uh, we have uh, we have been running the micro enterprise development program for many years now. Uh, we have trained about. Uh, Five and a half lakh uh, SAG women in uh, various uh, uh, skills that were required uh, by them. Uh, we also run a comprehensive uh, livelihood support program called the LEDP. Again, we have trained about uh, two lakh uh, SAG women uh, uh, over the years. Uh, so, so I think uh, uh, most of us have the tendency to work on the uh, uh, production side. We are. Uh, uh, wanting to uh, provide skills, uh, uh, and then uh, we want uh, people to produce. But then uh, there are not much of initiatives which are happening on uh, you know the post-production side, which is uh, you know if you produce something, you have to sell it also, and uh, that uh, becomes a challenge many times. Uh, although NABAD also supports uh, you know participation of the SAG women in various uh, marketing melas across the country. Uh, uh, but then I think we need some uh, very targeted uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know consistent uh, program uh, to, uh, to to take that forward. Then I think uh, see uh, the government of India has decided to promote about uh, uh, two lakh uh, primary societies across the country because uh, they wanted uh, one uh, primary society for every gram panchayat. Currently we have about ninety thousand plus uh, societies and. Uh, uh, for about two and a half lakh gram panchayats. So I think that is one major, uh, you know, uh, opportunity for uh, the SAG women uh, to participate instead of again uh, th doing things on their own. Uh, then again, we have the FPO program, which is running uh, about another 10,000 FPOs across the country, uh, where already a lot of inputs are being provided by various, uh, by the Ministry of Agriculture and uh, uh, various other players. And then uh, uh, Mr. Charanjit Singh was also talking of the PM FME program. So I think uh, uh, what's important is uh, uh, to bring all these uh, together uh, so as to benefit uh, the SAG women and the rural, rural women. 
and i think it's time we start uh, thinking of uh, what is the contribution of sgs to the rural gdp yeah so uh, um, when we have we are going to have a 5 trillion dollar economy by 25 what will be the contribution of sgs to this uh, 5 trillion dollar economy and i think we need to do all uh, things which will uh, you know uh, uh, help more and more sgs and sg women participate in the rural economy by actively contributing to the gdp of uh, of their uh, uh, areas so i think uh, with this uh, i still have time uh, I, i think i'll close and i'll co i'll come back uh, uh, when you have questions thank you yeah when we'll have some time for questions i'm mean, please note down all your questions your comments etc questions uh, possibly Uh, so we'll have some time after uh, the panels are presented. So thank you, Ram. Again, you painted a larger picture that how much does the rural economy uh, revive, and what kind of uh, contribution does the rural economy through the self-help groups make to the GDP? I think that's a grand vision to have. And uh, the basic summary, I think, it's ringing everywhere: is that how do all the actors and stakeholders work together, and, and not the SGs don't operate in isolation. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, Your uh, Um, Girija keep the tradition i'll go there yep okay yeah. um thank you very much uh, access uh, for this very very important uh, aspect on uh, sgs and how do we transition the women's uh, uh, livelihoods into enterprises and one pathway could be definitely the sgs as uh, strategic business units and um, um Uh, thank you very much uh, nrlm and uh, tamil nadu women development uh, corporation uh, officials to really showcase what has been the implementation on the ground and uh, i'm just uh, here sharing some of the experiences of uh, accompanying uh, projects implemented by with uh, governments with support from ifad and i've been a consultant and i had the opportunity to design and also take up the implementation support for these projects and uh, i could um, share with you some of the challenges and uh, uh, you know the what are the lessons we could really learn in terms of you know uh, enterprise promotion first i would like to take up the tamil nadu uh, tsunami uh, livelihood project post tsunami livelihood project implemented by tamil nadu women development uh, corporation um it was a, a, a post disaster kind of a project but which had the ambition of you know transitioning the women uh, livelihoods into enterprises almost 30% of the members were to be individual entrepreneurs as per the project design uh, this was as early as in 2006 and uh, when we tried to implement and uh, the project uh, management Uh, commissioned many studies and you know one year we spent in uh, really producing lot of uh, reports and uh, trying to see how we implement then finally the project management took a bold decision we go ahead and implement no more look at you know studies and tr how will they uh, guide and the project staff started uh, really implementing things on the ground so one of the opportunities which the project thought was to form group enterprises two thinking was behind that one is you know that um, individual enterprises uh, how do we select them how do we uh, ensure that you know they are sustainable that will take some more time because women have been functioning as a group for more than 5 6 years it would be easy for the women to really take up a enterprise uh, this thing and uh, take the risk together and more importantly how do we include the poorest of poor into the enterprise they didn't want to leave behind the poorest so that was a very conscious thought to form group enterprise so that the poorest of poor women also will get included in the process and the more enterprising women will build their capacity and pull them up that was a very conscious decision and um, it included you know some of the traditional subsectors but also more importantly more innovations like mud crab fattening and you know ornamental fishery several innovations also were uh, uh, being thought about and um, after uh, the whole mechanism was through 0% interest uh, free loan it was not a grant it was a loan given to the group which is essentially to be repaid over 3 years so after 2 years of experience what did we gain out of that was Uh, 27% of the groups continued as group enterprises but then what emerged was 
there were sub enterprises which emerged from the group enterprises because there were few women who were more leadership they were running the essentially the enterprise so they preferred to do it and many of the poorest of poor would prefer to work as you know as part of the unit and really do not want to be taking the risk of an entrepreneur so this was what uh, emerged and apart from the 27% which continued as group enterprise some 20% 20-22% closed down completely there was no activity in them the rest as i said you know it was either an individual enterprise and a small group learning from this the project took the path of promoting jlgs of smaller uh, joint liability groups of smaller uh, women uh, entrepreneurs trained them capacity built them linked them with the banking system and uh, initially napfins was the one who came forward because no other bank was uh, willing and then slowly the other uh, public sector banks also stepped in for uh, financing at the end of the project we could see that almost uh, 35% of the members either in the jlg route or in the individual enterprises they were borrowing more than a lakh of rupees really truly into the enterprise mode there was a pathway through which the whole thing uh, progressed and uh, if we the second uh, project which i would like to draw upon which had a very different pathway is that of mavim which has formed 10 lakh sgs and um, you know 1 million and 10 million women into uh, the whole uh, sg movement and the pathway which they chose was you know forming a very strong three tier structure of sgs then village organization and uh, uh, the cmrc they call it the federations the federations are sustainable they are only service provider there is no loan through that they only facilitate loans and then earn a commission for the uh, facilitation from the icici bank so when the federations were set up and they provided a very strong monitoring of the sgs the banks confidence particularly the private sector banks confidence in the sgs really was very high icici bank came forward and uh, really started lending in a big way almost 91% of the sgs were credit linked unlike the national uh, average of around 50 51% so the credit mo- moved the women through their livelihood and uh, enterprise path and uh, more importantly the group enterprises which is the topic today they were very few and they were selected very carefully were absolutely required where that group mechanism is needed only those uh, uh, aspects were considered particularly in the service industry and also in the uh, farm sector um, uh, where uh, landless women were uh, 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 leasing out land together and then they were uh, producing so they were ta- very very strategically chosen which of our group enterprises more than 80 90% of those group enterprises uh, really functioned well but uh, what really uh, moved about uh, you know 20% 20 25% of the women into more than 1 lakh uh, loan sg well, loan from their sg and uh, setting up their own uh, enterprises so the federations played a very large role in selection in mentoring and also in you know boosting their confidence with the overall support from the mavim which designed very specific capacity building particularly in building self confidence and also you know uh, making the behavioral changes which are very much required for the transition the one thing which uh, uh, stood out there is you know the ultra poor in spite of 15 years of sg there are still a significant um, number of women who are not even borrowing from their sgs what do we do about them how do we really build their capacity so when uh, we looked at this even sg leaders are not confident to lend to these women so mavim took an initiative of speaking to this woman reaching out to this woman one thing which came out very very strongly in this is the women said we don't even have the support of our own families so you know the others who are there functioning in the sgs they are taking up uh, these income generation moving to enterprise because the family support is there we don't seem to have that so mavim took up a very different initiative we heard about the brax uh, gra- ultra poor graduation program 
and uh, there they have been set upon the livelihood path and also um, you know i think uh, about uh, 50 to 60000 of those ultra poor are now in the pathway to livelihoods i think enterprises uh, something uh, beyond that so we need to think of very different uh, pathways when we come to the context and also you know what functions on the ground i'll also touch upon a very poor pvtg uh, groups in orissa where uh, the project as uh, these are as you know the particularly vulnerable tribal groups they are very isolated uh, working in you know remote uh, areas some of them are even now working as hunters gatherers they don't have a stable livelihood this project is working with them on how to improve their livelihoods here group enterprises are working and particularly in the area of ntfp and in terms of you know some of the joint farming uh, leasing and farming these uh, groups have been functional but there is a very large subsidy element uh, required for them to uh, push them on the path of uh, group enterprises because individually they seem to lack the confidence and the economy of scale to really work together so what can we glean from all these uh, this thing see i think sg as uh, business units are possible but they are more unique initiative and not so um, not at all you know will uh, become or should become the root path for you know most of the sg women and uh, the federation role is very very important in uh, selection in uh, you know mentoring in hand holding of any enterprise whether it is group enterprise or your individual enterprise and uh, though governments want the poorest of poor to be included but very few have risk taking capacity we should allow them to grow through the path of you know you graduate them to livelihoods and from livelihoods to enterprise expecting them to jump from a laborer to an entrepreneur even in a group mode that is extremely risky for them and um, there should be a strong economic reason for members to really come together and um, also um, a group uh, homogeneity is very necessary when we talk about the of the same uh, uh, same livelihood they should be doing or same activity they should be doing and um, kerala is a classic example where number of uh, group enterprises are uh, functional and functional very well we have a lot uh, lot to learn from them and uh, we should appreciate and let the group you know don't expect the group all of them will be equal and equitable there are going to be some uh, managers in the enterprises the others will be more as uh, you know workers in that we should completely um, you know understand and appreciate and let that evolution be and um, i think the pathways are many group enterprise is one of them but we need to really focus on how do we enable the livelihood and individual entrepreneurs to emerge i think that is the challenge most of the programs in the country are facing including nrlm how do we transition individual women to become entrepreneurs of their own right and uh, how do we enable the banks to have belief in these women who have 15 20 years of credit history in the bank in the sg they should look at it and really design good product thank you so much for this opportunity thank you thank you thank you so much so thank you girija again uh, you summarized it so well i don't need to summarize it any further but one point i particularly liked was the uh, the the you know the perspective of the very ultra poor people the, uh, the the you know particularly vulnerable tribal groups and the very very poor people i think that is a very important focus we need to necessarily keep in mind whenever we talk about this multiple pathways as you say there's no one pathway there are multiple pathways how do the mavim or the nrlm or the you know the tamil nadu program keep uh, you know you know kind of um, keep all these multiple pathways in sight and facilitate each of them as independent pathways because it actually caters to different kinds of poor people poor is not a homogeneous whole there are different kinds of people there are more entrepreneurial there are less entrepreneurial there are ultra poor so all of them need to be handheld and supported uh, and for that the whole ecosystem needs to come together thank you so uh, audience this is the presentation from the uh, five panelists here each of them very different and very rich uh, so i will open this uh, now to the audience for your very informed questions and then you can yourself direct who you want the 
answer to be from or or anybody can pick up the questions yeah there please somebody would need to give him a mic hello good morning everyone this is a really very nice session actually as i understand uh, reimagining the sgs is uh, like promoting gandhian model of development so nowadays it has its own challenges so uh, mike we can i mean as an institution government and uh, civil societies bodies can um, handle many challenges but the market my concern is about the market and value additions um, and uh, parallelly because parallelly government is promoting the fpos uh, msmes and other um, there are many big players in the market so how we will handle this this situation so uh, this is my concern and i want to just reply from the giza ma'am thank you yeah so who would you like who is the question addressed to to giza ma'am yes ji yes. ji markets and value additions is that the question yeah good question i think uh, the processing value addition the women definitely have uh, uh, an advantage and uh, we need to really work on the business viability of uh, the units whichever we set up or the initiatives we set up um many times what happens is you know government has a program you will go to maharashtra or any other place you know there are so many thur dal mills which have been uh, distributed which are lying idle most of the time and um, either the spare parts not available or you know some other uh, issues with the running the technology becomes an issue whether this is uh, the appropriate technology so i think as as uh, program implementers we need to be very very conscious uh, that before we take up any of this um, uh, you know initiative with the women we should do our uh, homework uh, thoroughly this is uh, something very very important when we take up any value addition and processing as far as the marketing is concerned for many of the government programs they look inward there are government uh, you know the government is a very large consumer themselves so they tie up with uh, different like vegetable growing we tie up with uh, uh, the youth uh, hostels or tribal um, uh, schools and uh, you know uh, mid day meal schemes so there are uh, opportunities available but then there are also programs which uh, try and uh, link up with the other uh, private sector uh, initiatives and uh, there are number of examples which are there there are number of challenges as well which are there we need to really ensure that the uh, uh, you know uh, the supply chain management is uh, really undertaken well so that the private te- sector engagement will be much better one route is of course the fpo movement which we uh, i think uh, 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 both uh, belwal ji and as well as mr tarnjit singh uh, mentioned so that is definitely a path for ensuring uh, marketing of their products thank you thank you yeah please mic here a very good morning to everybody my name is upasna jain and i represent resham sutra and uh, we are in the business of making uh, livelihood machines for the women who are into the sericulture industry so i'm just building the context we started with that uh, subsidy is very important when it comes to sdgs uh, sorry i mean the self help groups and uh, let i think the data we shared was 10% as seed 30% subsidy and 60% loans now my question is these women they get so used to the subsidy to the machines they use it they're very happy but when it comes to technology upgradation of buying new machines they again look back at that subsidy from the government so how to get them out of that mindset of depending on all these schemes that's my question number 1 question number 2 is we are talking about these women as very very vulnerable we work with these very vulnerable women in the tribal belt so how do we cover them or provide them cover for risk the agricultural risk for example last year we had severe crop failure so they didn't have enough cocoons 
So what could be actions taken to provide these entrepreneurs, the whom we are, you know, trying to enable, empower, but how do we cover up for the rest, which are very, very, you know, based on nature and agriculture? So that is addressed to the Tamil Nadu. Uh, <laughs> the first Darshan. one is obviously. The first one is obviously. Uh, so so you could take. Uh, I, I use the term subsidy very uh, widely here because it is it is it is more of an encouragement to the bank to lend to the women rather than and subsidy for the women to claim to. This this is for the ecosystem to be developed. I am totally with you on the point that we create this launching pad through this and then allow them to flutter. We do not keep uh, holding them with the subsidy angle and then not allow them to fly high. That's not the intention of the program at all. It's, it's, it's a launching pad because what happens most of the times is that SEG women get access to a vulnerability uh, relief from uh, linkages from SEG, uh, credit linkage program and others. But then if as a member, I want to do a business, what usually happens in the SEG network is that if I get an access to four lakh as in credit assistance from the bank, we share it amongst the 10 members. So ultimately, I get 40,000 to 50,000 as a single SAG member. That's what most probably happens in most of the states and most of the groups. But if I want to start a business, 40,000 is not enough, right? So how do I go to the bank to uh, take this loan of uh, 5 lakhs or 6 lakhs for my business with a business plan and uh, get, it, get access to finance? Not as a group, as an entrepreneur per se. It's just that launching pad through this uh, initiative that is being done. It's to create the ecosystem. It's not a mot motivator. See, that's why we see that this front end, this program, especially that I'm talking about, is a front end subsidy to the bank and a back end subsidy to the entrepreneur. It's more for the ecosystem development rather. Otherwise, what we see now is that a lot of applications go to the bank after a screening. The banks do not come forward to access uh, finance to these. Uh, uh, there are a lot of apprehensions. I, I also see it from a banker's point of view without a collateral, without a base. But then these are, uh, and they do not have any experience. They do not have an education to run a business. So how do you uh, still, I mean, I come to this uh, question of dichotomy, which I've reserved for the last, but then since you've uh, provoked me to tell that, whether entrepreneurs are uh, born or self-made. I think successful entrepreneurs are self-made, right? Any entrepreneur can be born, but to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to build that capacity in you to bring that. But then the, for that, the ecosystem needs to be developed and we are on the path towards it and this, that's where this is going. I mean, second one, sh you want to take it, yeah. It, yeah. Um, thank you. I think, you know, this is where uh, I work in many countries, nowhere this uh, subsidies are available. So in a way, India is unique, even among the <laughs> many South Asian countries where we have large subsidies available to spur this entrepreneurship. But what happens is, you know, there is an expectation that further subsidies will be available whenever we want to expand or upgrade or whatever. I think as a facilitating organization, you need to tell the woman very clearly what is the business she is losing by not upgrading, okay? If you wait for the subsidy, you need to wait for two years, three years. And then within that three years, if you put your own money or take a bank loan and invest in this upgradation, what would be your income vis-a-vis -vis waiting for two, three years? Then the choice is hers, okay? So many women, when we explain to them, don't wait for the subsidy indefinitely. You have already had a dose, but go for, you know, the, your own uh, in internal generation and bank loan and showcase what is the opportunity you are losing, then they are able to take it up and move ahead. On the market risk and, uh, you know, the other aspects, I think there have been um, uh, some studies earlier and also some recommendations in uh, setting up a risk fund. And I think uh, uh, particularly for as NRLM and other SRLMs move the pathway towards uh, uh, larger enterprises and also with the various uh, climate related uh, risks which are happening um, in agriculture sector. And also you took the example of TASAR, right? And uh, even in others. So we, it is high time. We need to think about what is the um, more of a global risk uh, uh, mitigation mechanism which could be thought of. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Girija. I think uh, we are running short of time. So yeah, one last just, question uh, from Kalpana here, and then uh, uh, we'll give a minute each to everybody. I think uh, Girija talked about risk fund, and uh, I had this question for uh, Ramakrishna ji. We have been hearing, and we have been also implementers of MEDP and LEDP. It uh, needs to graduate beyond uh, uh, the programs that it is currently designed, because as we know, uh, the presentations of Bailwalji and uh, uh, Tamil Nadu Women's De Development Corporation talk about a lot of successes because a lot of risk is ab absorbed by the government. So government is there, so therefore they can give orders. They are the market also, and they are also taking care of the risks. But uh, eventually women have to be mainstreamed into uh, uh, the market because government cannot keep providing orders. They have millions of women to cater to. And uh, there, that is where uh, financial institutions need to come up uh, because we are catering to uh, the needs of poorest of poor. And as Girija was also mentioning, it's not possible for them to scale up to enterprise level in a day or two. We need time and we need some funds. So what is NABARD doing in terms of MEDP, LEDP revisions? OK. Uh, uh, see, NABARD addresses. Uh, a huge uh, stakeholder uh, population. Uh, so there are still a lot of people uh, who uh, use MEDPs as uh, a gateway to you know enterprise development. Uh, so uh, while we have the schemes of MEDP and LEDP running successfully uh, over a longer long period of time, uh, we have other schemes also to take care of people who are now uh, uh, who who you know who are sort of. Uh, come out of the LDDP mode and uh, they're in a position to set up uh, uh, perhaps uh, startups of their own and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we have set up about uh, seven agriculture uh, and business incubation centers in about seven universities across the country and a lot of startups uh, do visit uh, these institutions uh, for uh, uh, mentoring support for you know for support relating to the product uh, development, for support related to catalytic capital that they may require. So uh, we have uh, one for every need, in, in so to say. So it depends on what stage of evolution you are as an entrepreneur. And then you can uh, tap into the uh, relevant scheme that uh, you can leverage and uh, which will best uh, suit you your purpose. So thank you. So that, uh, yeah. So I think uh, now we are kind of uh, reaching the closure of the program. A minute each to each of you for your closing uh, observations. So any any further points that you have? I will say something about repeated subsidy for the same intervention. As far I as I have understood that repeated. Subsidy, looking for repeated subsidy for the same intervention means the intervention has failed. Otherwise, successful people do not look for subsidy again and again. This is based on my own experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I will just uh, clarify two things which were mentioned during the course of discussion of this panel. One thing is that is the ultra poor. So we are already working on this ultra poor strategy and we have sanctioned two specific projects for Bihar and Jharkhand and uh, they are taking off successfully. So that is one thing I wanted to clarify. We know that uh, there are certain issues and we need to address the concerns of ultra poor on priority. And we have prepared one white paper also on that, that how to address the concerns of them. And the second thing is, uh, I also appreciate uh, that working in a collective is different, but sometimes we need to work uh, individually also. That's for, for the SSG members, I'm saying specifically. And uh, banks are more than willing to fund the uh, SSG, that is the groups. But funding of individual is an issue, so that's why we got the cabinet section for this Women Enterprise Acceleration Fund. So that we are facilitating the individual enterprises. That is the, we are facilitating the banks through that credit guarantee fund. We are supporting the credit guarantee to the banks for these individual enterprises. So that also we are taking care. Thank you. So all the speakers had touched upon, I think, everything about SAG and enterprises. 
uh, staying true to the uh, topic for discussion today. Um, great questions from the uh, uh, the other side. Um, the understanding has dwelled upon into us in the last uh, one uh, hour that we need to concentrate on enterprises. We need to concentrate on rural enterprises. We need to concentrate on rural enterprises and making them uh, self-sustainable, rather, right? Self-sustainable. Sustainability does not come easy. Creating something is much easier. Making them self-sustainable is a hard task. And uh, uh, all that we can do from the government and all of us together is to, do, to work towards a collaborative uh, side where we teach the community that this is the path we handhold your path to take the leads. And then you have to uh, stride forward uh, alone and then also uh, start flying from there on. I think that's where all of us need to work together, teach the community that we are here only to take your baby steps. And then you then take on your larger strides from there on. And uh, we've all been working towards that. And I hope we see a rural India and uh, uh, definitely a uh, developed rural India, a new entrepreneurial women-centric uh, approach uh, is building on. And uh, our rural sector is, uh, as I see from the field, is ready to observe whatever is put in there. Thank you. Um, I think uh, the programs uh, now need to really concentrate on the enterprise. Having had 30 years of SSG bank linkage in the country, um, uh, we need to have a clear pathway for the enterprises to uh, really come up. And uh, it is uh, definitely needed that the livelihoods and the ultra poor need uh, uh, focus. But when we really enable the women to become entrepreneurs, they pull another 20 women up. This has been the experience everywhere. Either they employ them or they are the role models for others to really come up. So I think uh, that is where we need to really emphasize in the next 10 years. Thank you. Uh, I have already said that, uh, you know, we should look at uh, 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 capturing the SSG's contribution to the rural economy, which was uh, in, in a way what uh, 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 you wanted as the last word from my side. But then uh, uh, having seen SSG's uh, and having seen uh, the evolution of SSGs, SSGs were, uh, you know, conceived as a means of providing uh, access to financial services to the rural women who were bypassed. That was the main uh, objective. But then there were lots of unintended, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, lots of uh, um, incidental benefits which also came out of this. One which is, uh, you know, economic uh, empowerment and empowerment of the person, uh, of the women. Uh, which we should, uh, you know, try to look at much more closely. And because once you see, a, once you work on empowerment of the of the person, the person will not wait for you and me to help him or her. They will find ways of uh, doing it themselves. So what we need uh, then to do is to, you know, just to sort of catalyze that process. So uh, the woman empowerment is something which we should, you know, again bring back. Uh, uh, to the for, uh, forefront uh, to enable whatever you want to SSG, uh, for SSGs to happen, this will take care of that. Thank you. Yeah, we just about a minute left. So thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you to everybody. This, uh, I'm not going to summarize again uh, because I've been trying to do that as was people were speaking and they also have summarized themselves. Uh, one large message I've taken away from here is that, you know, the whole um, you know, 30 years of the SAG movement and about 10, more than 10 years of the NRLM itself. Now, there's a strong focus on livelihoods. And uh, as the panelists have uh, said, it is possible to create that massive livelihood uh, impetus in the countryside through the SAG platform. Uh, we need to work with that grand vision of, you know, maybe 30%, 40% of the GDP coming out of the self-help group enterprises. That is a vision we need to have. And we need to have a very strong outcome focus at the household level. You know, are they, how much income are they earning? So it's not just about need inputs, but also the outcomes that are creating there. And whether you call it group enterprises or individual enterprises, I feel there is a strong sense of collective anyway. So even if the self-help groups are working as a group or the individual woman is working as an independent entrepreneur, you need a whole ecosystem around that uh, enterprise. Then only actually the whole thing becomes successful. You need multiple kinds of finances to come in. You need a risk mitigation. You need subsidies. You need uh, massive private capital to come in. So there is a sense of the collective everywhere, not just at the group level, 
but at the ecosystem level and at the institutional level also. So I think uh, it is possible and uh, therefore there is a very positive uh, note that the panel has given. And uh, thank you, thank you for the, thank you for listening so intently and thank you for the questions. Thank you Access for the opportunity. <laughs> enriching discussion and highlighting the need for creating an ecosystem for women through multi-stakeholder collaboration where they can access credit, market, skill, knowledge and services and that they not only can become successful and sustainable entrepreneurs and but also towards a more political empowerment. So thank you so much panelists.